The Outer Hebrides, one of the few areas left in Scotland where most children speak two languages, one native to the islands, the other foreign. But in this part of Britain, the foreign language is English. The first words most of these children learned to speak were Gaelic. In some places, the peat layer is 15 or 20 feet deep. It's still commonly used as fuel instead of coal, and it's cut by means of an iron. John Patterson has a croft in the island, and with his wife he cuts the peat in early spring or summer for use during the autumn and winter. Like the other crofters, they're allocated a peat bank for their own private use. Unlike Skye, Lewis is mainly flat. There are very few trees, and large areas of the island are covered with black moorland, peat bogs, and stony ground. But increasingly, once barren moorland is being reclaimed for grazing. It's done by spreading sand and fertilizers on the land, then sowing clover and grass seed on top. The process is called reseeding. <laughs> the island sheep have been among the first to benefit from reseeding, because already in Lewis, thousands of acres of land that used to be sour and infertile have been changed into good grazing land for cattle and sheep, and at no great cost either. In the islands, perhaps the most common type of sheep is the Scottish blackface, a hardy breed that manages to thrive despite the climate and the comparatively sparse grazing. The sheep are usually dipped once a year to kill off ticks and other vermin that destroy the wool. In rural districts, each township often owns a few thousand acres of common grazing land on the moors. All the crofters in the township have the right to graze their animals on it, and it's quite usual for the men of a township to get together to work as a community, often with the women as well, at jobs like sheep dipping or shearing. Sheep have played an important role in the Highlands and Islands during the last 200 years. They helped to bring about the first Highland clearances, because many landowners evicted their crofters from the best land to give the sheep good pasture for grazing. So the introduction of sheep helped to begin the flow of people from the islands to other parts of Britain and overseas. And this flow is still going on today. But in recent times, wool has helped to bring a new prosperity to Lewis. And many crofters like John Patterson now spend most of their time not crofting, but weaving. We just changed quite a lot. In my young days, um, it was very much a crofter industry. Um, the family wool crop was being uh, washed, dyed, carded, spun, and even tailored in the crofter's home. And only what was surplus to their own requirements uh, sold elsewhere. Uh, it has changed 
quite a lot. It has become more commercialized. In fact, it has become one of the biggest businesses today in the country. Our export record in Harris Tweed is uh, as good as, as most industries today in Britain. It goes to all parts of the world, the US, the continent, even one of our best customers today are in Japan. This spinning wheel is over a hundred years old and Mrs. Patterson showed us how it works. At one time it was laid down that Harris Tweed had to be hand spun in this way as well as hand woven to qualify for the trademark. But nowadays the spinning is done in one of the island factories. And today the whole range and style of Harris Tweed is constantly changing and developing. Uh, one mill claims to have more than 50,000 patterns of its own. Of course there are many different kinds of tweeds lightweights, middleweights, featherweights, heavyweights, and it's also used uh, by industry, shipping companies, airlines use it for furnishings and for many other things. This peat stack in front of John Patterson's house is a typical site on the island, but the houses themselves are usually modern and just like houses anywhere else. The township where he lives, like most on the island, is built near the coastline, and like many Lewismen, John Patterson is quite familiar with the sea. I've done quite a variety of jobs. I've been a while making Harris tweeds, some agriculture of contracting, out with the tractors, mowing, reaping, thrashing, also as a merchant, selling goods, uh, feeding stuffs, groceries, and uh, again I'm back at weaving, and this is the general pattern all over the, the Isles, especially in Lewis. At the age of 17, I joined the Mason Navy. And uh, from there, went down to London, from there, went on the Australian run, uh, and then on to New Zealand, mm. Canada. You know, this is what happens up in the Isles. Uh, especially in my young days. Most of the youth uh, had little to do here by way of employment and uh, that's why you find so many in almost all the seaports of the world. Uh, the women folk, most of them too had to leave either on domestic service, in hospitals, You'll also find them all over the world. But somehow, we keep coming back to the Isles. The call of the Isles. Whatever it is, we like to come back. It's so different to be in inner city. There, if one leaves the city eh, for a few years, he comes back, he finds everything new, new faces. But in the Isles, it's so different. We come back to the old scenes. It may seem bare to the stranger, but there's something in it that calls us back. But the appearance of Lewis is changing quite rapidly too. And places like this old corner in Garenheim are now a rarity on the island. Yet it's not so long ago that this black house, now a museum, would have been a common sight in Lewis. In the old days, the building was shared by the family and their animals. Today, the thatched houses that remain are often used as outbuildings. The town of Stornoway, the capital of Lewis and the largest town in the Hebrides, tends to draw people in from the rural parts of the island. It's a natural harbour, and it used to be a main centre for herring fishing. At 
one time more than a thousand fishing boats operated from Stornoway Harbour, though they didn't all belong to the island. But there was a steady decline over the years, until about ten years ago it was estimated that less than a dozen boats remained. But in 1961 the Highland Development Board decided to help, and it began to lend money to selected fishermen to buy their own vessels. Today, mainly due to this help, the fishing industry is again reviving in Stornoway. Already, just a few years after the scheme began, there are nearly 50 boats operating again. Though it's not herring now, but whitefish that they catch. Fishing is still a dangerous job, though not so bad as in the old days of sail. Then, in one single year, more than a hundred fishermen from Scotland alone were drowned. Long ago, most island fishermen were only part-time sailors. They spent the rest of their time working ashore on their crofts. Nowadays, they work full-time, and they might spend most of the week away from home, perhaps returning only midweek and for the weekend. Apart from anything else, it's a highly competitive business, and any time spent in port or steaming between fishing grounds is costly in time and fuel. The boats require to be at sea for at least 48 weeks of the year. Depending on the weather conditions and the size of the previous catches, the net might be trawled three or possibly four times in one day. As soon as the net's been dropped overboard again, the seamen start to gut the latest catch and sort the fish into different boxes according to size and type. And no matter how skillful the fishermen are, there's a big element of luck involved. There's absolutely no way of knowing beforehand whether the catch is a good or a bad one. With all its modern equipment, it's quite usual for a fishing boat to cost over 40,000 pounds today. So it's not surprising that each boat spends as much time as possible at sea. Most boats from Stornoway land their catch on the mainland so that the fish can reach the main markets more quickly. And they often spend the night there too if it's near the fishing grounds. But once or twice during the week they usually return to Stornoway for the night. And some land the catch there in time for the evening fish auction, which is held most evenings of the week on the quayside. <laughs> two pound a box? One of it, two pounds. 
And he wins with two pound, two pound, two, two pound four, two pound four, two pound six, two pound six, two pound eight, two pound ten, two pound twelve, two pound twelve, two pound fourteen, two pound fourteen, and he runs two pound sixteen, two pound sixteen, two pound sixteen, two pound sixteen. It's not so much the size of a catch that's important. What matters is how much the other fishermen have caught. The scarcer the fish, the more you're likely to get for it. So it's not always the big catch that wins. Some of the fish is sold for processing in the local factory and some goes to the local fish merchants or the fish and chip shops. But even with weaving and fishing and the other occupations, Lewis is still desperately short of jobs, despite the efforts of places like Lewis Castle College in Stornoway. In the islands, education is often called an export industry, and the college runs a training ship to fit boys for the merchant navy. Lewis has always had strong links with the Saudis. Steering wheel is now in the Mitchie position. We know that because the, the mat spoke and this pointer are at zero. This indicates the rudder is poor now. To alter course to the right of the starboard, the top of the wheel, take it to the right. To go to the left or port, the wheel is, top of the wheel is put to port. Now the art of steering is to steer the straightest possible course with the least possible effort. The black line in front of the compass there is the lover line that indicates the poor and line of the ship. But at sea, one must remember that when we are the helmsman, we get orders from the officer and watch, the master or the pilot. When he gives you an order, you repeat that order in a loud voice. Next to weaving, the merchant service is just about the most important occupation for Lewismen. A heavy drain on the population of Lewis, since the seamen usually return only for leave. And so far at least, the college only caters for men. Girls who want further training usually have to leave the island altogether. Maybe some of them will return. But unless things change, it looks as though too many young people will continue to leave the islands for the mainland, or for a life at sea. Stand by the pump. All ready, up. And start pumping. Although Lewismen have always made their mark as seamen, the constant drain of youngsters away from the islands has the result of unbalancing the population there. Too many old people, too few young. And this is slowly wasting away their ancient Gallic language and culture. Mommy, ooh. <laughs> 